Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Rockefeller, Jr. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a wonderful day. I am proud to have been part of it, and thanks to all of you for having been here and contributed, and to those of you who have committed to tomorrow as well, thank you doubly. Um, this is, as Judith Roden was saying, uh, really the beginning of the Rockefeller Foundation centennial. Don't know if it's the warm up or the spring training, but uh, our actual centennial is in 2013, so thanks for helping us practice, but these are real games, too. Um, John D. Rockefeller Sr. is my great-grandfather, and unfortunately, I didn't know him, so I, I have no personal anecdotes, but John D. Rockefeller Jr., his son, my grandfather, I actually knew quite well. I think I was in my early 20s when uh, he died. He was uh, really the active member of the family on the board. Uh, it's been said, and I still can hardly believe it, Judy, that my great-grandfather, who founded the foundation, never went to a board meeting, never attended a board meeting. Uh, that's a lot of trust. That's a lot of trust. And one of the people he trusted most was his son, John Jr., who was at the same time shy, meticulous, gracious, determined, caring, very on time, and amazingly connected to people. Um, I've had a chance to read some of his, uh, his letters in the Rockefeller archives that are being used very actively by the foundation as we look back and try to think what are the nuggets and what are the stories from our history. And there was one of them in which he went with the head of the National Park Service at the time to Taos and visited the Taos Pueblo and was trying to understand the essence of the, of the culture of the Pueblo people. And what I've seen uh, and, and so much enjoyed were examples of his correspondence afterwards with the head of the Park Service trying to decide whether both of the chiefs get cowboy hats or only one of them, and then who gets the Western scarves. And he, he was so meticulous and so caring because he wanted to do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis a culture that he obviously did not know very well, but tried deeply. So I'm kind of carrying, trying to carry the essence of him and thinking about him. He died back in about 1960. So what would my forebears think about the foundation today? Um, certainly very proud of the 99 years so far, uh, proud of the individuals, institutions, and fields that the foundation had supported. The Rocky Docks, and if you've been occasionally watching the flashes of images up here, you saw the check to Albert Einstein that turned out to be twice what he asked for. And that was very good. Um, and the, the, the gifts to, uh, the, the contributions to institutions, to Johns Hopkins um, School of Public Health, Judy mentioned the Red Cross, to the Peking Union Medical College, still existing today, having survived both a Japanese invasion and the communist um, uh, repressive regime of the communist years, still the place where, by the way, I understand that if you are a high government official, that's where you want to be taken care of. So wonderful, and it's having its 100th anniversary almost at the same time that we are. And then the fields that we supported, agricultural productivity and, and public health, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, 
there's a lot of pride that, that I have uh, in all of that. But what also would they think of our world today, the founders? Uh, the speed of communication. I understand that a message at the beginning, a hundred years ago, might have taken a month to get to one of the remote offices, one second today. So imagine if you say the wrong thing today, you can take it back the next second, um, but, then, but then you could not. Um, we've gone from handwriting to voice recognition um, communication. Uh, is all of it good? Mm -hmm. Probably not all good, but we're with it and we're, we're using it. They would also be looking at the demand side of the equation from two to seven billion people and headed up to maybe nine or more. How will they might be thinking the Rockefeller Foundation find the right language to rejoin the conversation about how many of us there are. They would look at the rise of Asia and they would be delighted that a set of cultures that drew my family's attention a hundred plus years ago and in which they were deeply engaged as, um, as connectors, as collectors, as supporters, that so much of Asia today is flourishing and I think they would clearly be de delighted about that. They would look at the role of the US in the world and be asking themselves, I'm sure, what is the proper new role for a nation that they so loved and were so loyal to? Muscle man, compassionate friend, mentor, inventor, financier, you know, what blend of those actions are appropriate for the U.S. in the world of this century. Turning to my own couple of reflections as I think about the next hundred years, and I find that a very daunting task, and I'm glad all of you are helping us do that, but I wonder, for example, at the great opportunity to reinvent cities and to put a much more positive spin on cities and their communities. The Rockefeller Foundation, I'm glad to say, is already engaged in that effort. And we have a Jane Jacobs Prize in New York City, for example, and are deeply involved in the support of cities. Um, quo vadis. Um, also, I wonder at how men can be assisted in seeing the, the positive changing roles of women in the world and adjust to them, should we say, fruitfully and with a little higher level of positive acceptance. I wonder how we will find, we the Foundation, new partners to help us do what we do. Um, pr between the wars, the Rockefeller Foundation, it said, made more, uh, gave more foreign aid than the U.S. government. Well. Those statistics have totally changed today. We need partners, we want partners, we know some of you are in the room and we, we welcome that. We need other funders, we need good grantees, and we need thinkers to help us. I wonder what new frontiers will we encounter or explore? The mysteries of the connections between the brain and the heart or the mysteries of the functioning of oceans, et cetera. I wonder what new ways we will learn to communicate what we are learning, blending the science and the art, blending statistics and stories to be more effective in reaching the people we need to, to reach. So my feelings tonight are a mixture of, I'd have to say, Pride, apprehension, and trust. Pride in my fellow trustees, Dick Parsons, Strive, who has joined us, and of course, Judy. Pride in the Foundation's extraordinary staff of professionals and support people, many of whom you've seen here over these days. Pride in the 
100 years of grant making, pride in my forebears for their generosity and vision, but some apprehension, apprehension about the human tendency to favor the short term over the long term, to emphasize material values over spiritual and communal, to stress our differences sometimes more than our commonalities. But I have trust, trust as my grandfather and great-grandfather had, that future leaders like you will continue to see the way to address both the persistent and the fresh challenges we face, and that you will take advantage of, as appropriate, your youth, your sense of innovation, your ability, greater than mine, I hope, to deal with the speed, and certainly your resilience. So in closing, and before I do my main task, which is an introduction, as a sailor, I just want to close with two metaphors that were actually used today. We're all in the same boat, so all hands on deck. 